Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of Mind Makes This World. I'm your host, Nathan Smith, and today I am joined by a number of, of really wonderful guests here. First and foremost, I should mention that this is actually a joint production between my channel, Mind Makes This World, and my good friend Stephen Pinecker's channel, Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. Steve's there with the hat on. Um, this is actually part two of a conversation that we began on Steve's channel, Mormon Book Reviews, which uh, I will have a link to in the description below. I strongly recommend going to check that out um, to get a more, a fuller version of this conversation here, because we are kind of halfway through things, in fact. So uh, if you want a foundation for what we're discussing, I strongly recommend it. And of course, Steve has a lot of excellent content if you're interested in Mormonism in general, too. Um, with that said, my guests today are Lincoln Cannon and Carl Youngblood, Lincoln and Carl are both members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, more commonly known as Mormons. They are also transhumanists with backgrounds in the humanities and the sciences and in entrepreneurship. We have a, a little bit fuller uh, in, uh, introduction to y'all for the, the previous episode, but if you'd like to add anything to Lincoln and Carl, please feel free. No problem. That's pretty good. I'd say let's just jump right into it. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, in the in the previous episode, uh, we ended things with Steve by uh, kind of showcasing the question I wanted to begin this this episode with, which is uh, what drew the two of you like individually? What what's your history with encountering transhumanism? How'd you first encounter it, and what is it about transhumanism that appeals to you personally? Want to start, Carl? Uh, sure. I guess I'll go. I was yeah, waiting please. for you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that, um, you know, I encountered transhumanism around a time when I was in a phase of kind of deep exploration, um, of, of my faith. And when I was encountering other friends like Lincoln and others who were in a similar phase of their journey and were looking at both, uh, challenges to the faith, um, things that were expanding our understanding of the world around us and of our own upbringing and our own background and our own his our own church's history and also um the things that were going on in the world around us you know presently and uh thinking how can we apply our faith more meaningfully in the real world that we encounter today is it just a legacy of the past or is it something that um, you know, should still have some kind of influence on, on the current world. And so, um, in the process of exploring some of our favorite aspects of Mormonism and, um, uh, some of the things that we're personally interested in, we discovered a movement transhumanism, which was looking at the ways that humanity is in some kind of trajectory of progress and of improvement and uh, finding some eerily similar uh, predictions of transhumanism about the future that sounded kind of like a technologist or a scientific person describing the same kinds of things that perhaps the prophets who wrote uh, various books of scripture might have described if they had only had the vocabulary to describe it that way, right? So as we looked at these and found some interesting parallels and complements between transhumanism and religion generally, and Mormonism in particular, we thought, wow, there's um, a lot of interesting uh, food for thought here and um, interesting avenues of exploration. And, and that that's kind of what got me going. This was about 2000 five or so in that general time frame when we first started getting together as friends and having some monthly discussions around these topics. So Nathan, I, I came across transhumanism uh, by name when I um, essentially I had lost my faith. I was an atheist um, at the time. I did not op openly identify as an atheist. Um, when my friends would talk to me about the subject, which I enjoyed talking about, I would tell them to keep things light, um, that I was agnostic toward extraterrestrial humanoid deities. And, and so that, that's when I came across transhumanism 
by name. Um, but the reason why transhumanism influenced me the way it did when I eventually came across it was because of my Mormon background. I was, I was raised in a Mormon family. Um, my father was a computer programmer. My mother was a converted Catholic whose uh, interpretation of Christianity was heavily influenced by the notion that faith without works is dead. She liked practical religion a lot. And my father as a, as a computer programmer, and this was a long time before being a computer programmer was a popular profession. So he, you know, he was one of the original coders of WordPerfect, if anybody remembers what that software was, which was the, the, uh, the most um, popular, the most broadly used word processing software in the world before Microsoft Word. And uh, anyway, so I grew up in a household that had a very positive attitude towards technology and a very positive attitude towards practical interpretations of Christianity, um, whether that was my mother's Catholic upbringing or the Mormonism that we all shared, of course, while I was growing up. As a teenager, I became increasingly skeptical of my received interpretation of Mormonism. I was very analytical by nature. I asked lots of questions. I did lots of research. My father, um, my father gave me tools that most people didn't have access to. For example, he gave me all of the Journal of Discourses and lots of other early Mormon writings on a disc that I was able to search and, and read. So not only could I read the Journal of Discourses as a teenager, I was also able to search through them and find things that were interesting to read about. And, and so I became more acquainted with uh, Mormon history than almost anybody else that I knew as a teenager. And then that includes most of the adults that I ever encountered. And so as I was navigating these challenges, I didn't really have anybody to help me. And I had to like kind of deal with it on my own. And I did talk to my parents, particularly my father about it. And he was a very open-minded person. He was never, he never attacked me for being the analytical sort or asking hard questions. He always listened. He was always compassionate with my challenges. Um, but ultimately, um, I started to really have a very strange faith. A in my late teenage years, I, I did decide to, to serve a mis mission for the church. And um, in the MTC, I remember talking with other missionaries during a testimony meeting, they called it. And that's where, of course, people share their perspectives on the religion and share the feelings about the religion. And it's very traditional and common among Mormons to say things like, I know the church is true. I know the scriptures are true, things like that. And during this testimony meeting with my fellow missionaries, I, I remember telling them, listen, I don't know a lot of things that, that you know, but I do trust in the, in the principles that these, uh, that, that our scriptures teach. And I have great hope in the future that they describe. And I want to go share with people that trust and that hope that I have in this message. And so that's how I went on a mission. Um, but then upon return from my mission, I, I, I ran into some real challenges in my in my day to day life. My father was, um, he got his third case of cancer, he had cancer twice when I was growing up. And this third case killed him. Um, I also had just graduated from school and gotten married, had my first child. And so I was, I, I, I was in that period of life when I have lots of new stressors. My dad's dead. I'm now required to provide for my brand new family. And um, I was trying to resituate myself in the world and my faith cracked. I lost it. And um, I, I found myself in a situation where I was trying to reassess purpose. Um, reassess the, you know, the narrative situation of my life, how I would deal with it. And um, important to this story is that, of, of course, I, I lived in a Mormon community. I was married with a, a, a woman who I loved dearly and loved to this day dearly. That was also, you know, we got married in the temple. And, and yet here I was in this challenging faith situation. And so I, I, I was exploring what to do with that. I had to figure it out. It was emotionally straining, intellectually straining. And in the process, I made the decision to do a few things. 
One is I wanted to go back and reread the Bible from the perspective of somebody who no longer had faith and see what I could glean from it from that perspective. Because I knew even from a secular perspective, uh, the Apostle Paul, for example, whose works I focused on, had been incredibly influential. And I wanted to try to figure out why Paul had been so influential um, just from a secular angle. Like what, 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 what was it about Paul that changed the world? And it really did. It changed the world. And I recognized that. And so I wanted to get to take that approach to Paul. Um, another thing that I wanted to do is, I, is, you know, I had recently graduated with a degree in philosophy from Brigham Young University. And, I, and there were some philosophers that I had been introduced to that I wanted to dig into more deeply. Two of them in particular were William James, the American pragmatist philosopher, and Friedrich Nietzsche, the German, um, you might call him an existentialist philosopher. So I started reading them uh, quite extensively. And then um, those, a, a couple of things happened as a consequence of reading those sources. One, on, on the Christian front, on reading Paul, I, and this might sound strange, I became more of a Christian than I had ever been, even while I was an atheist, because I was influenced by the practical ramifications of the doctrine and the interpretation of doctrine that Paul advocates in the New Testament. I, I became persuaded in part because of my studies of William James that the practical difference that Paul's teachings had made in the world and yet could make in the world were incredibly valuable. And so I, I, I wanted to, con to maintain my Christian identity, even though I could not bring myself to believe in a God out there at that time. And then um, Nietzsche's perspective on Christianity was also interesting. I mean, Nietzsche criticized quite strongly. He, you know, he presents it as, a, as a, a, a criticism of Christianity in general. But what I found him actually to be criticizing was a more, um, let's call it platonic um, interpretation of Christianity, um, a, an interpretation of Christianity heavily influenced by the works of of the philosopher Plato and the Neoplatonists and in actually a, a very impractical and I think escapist interpretation of Christianity, which because of my Mormon upbringing, I did not consider to be essential to Christianity. In fact, I considered that to be like not the strongest version of Christianity, although a very wide interpretation of Christianity at Nietzsche's, at Nietzsche's time and place. And so I sympathize strongly with his criticism while also sympathizing with his advocacy for um, humanity's capacity to approach what he would call, um, you know, in English translations, the Superman or the Overman. Um, and and th that also resonated a bit with my Mormon upbringing in the sense that, of course, um, Mormon theology advocates that we should become like God. Now, um, Nietzsche approached that by diverting away from God and, and calling super the Superman something different. But I found a strong resonance between Nietzsche's thoughts and Mormonism. Um, during this time, when I was becoming increasingly influenced by these ideas, I came across a couple of writers on the Internet. Now the Internet had become a thing at this point in time. I grew up without the Internet. But at this point in time, while I, when I had lost my faith, the Internet was a thing. And I came across a couple of writers who at the time I didn't know were re related to each other, but um, ended up being, I, as I discovered later, one of them was Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil, um, of course, he's a famous inventor, you know, Kurzweil keyboards and such, but he also became a very well-known advocate of the idea of the technological singularity. The idea that um, the confluence of technologies would result in an acceleration of technological development, which would lead to revolutions in biotechnology, nanotechnology, and ultimately cognitive technologies and integrations between humanity and artificial intelligence development, and ultimately this explosion of intelligence that would result in a world that would change so rapidly and profoundly that humans as we are today would no longer be able to predict or control that future. And he called that the technological singularity. And he had this idea that um, if we wanted to participate in such a future, we might be able to, and we might be able to, in the process, overcome death altogether. 
and use technology to promote, um, you know, persistent human longevity. But to get there, we would need to use some more mundane technologies, some more ordinary technologies to, in his words, live long enough to live forever. And the things he was talking about were just common sense things like, hey, if you're not exercising, exercise. If you're not sleeping um, well at night or long enough, start sleeping better. Um, if you're not eating nutritious food, start eating better food. If you're not taking dietary supplements that can help improve your longevity marginally, you should start taking those. And so he had all these things he advocated in the effort to live long enough to live forever with the ultimate expectation being that we would end up living in a world beyond present notions of poverty and suffering and death if we channel our efforts in that direction. And of course, this resonated with my Mormon upbringing too in a lot of interesting ways because um, Mormon theology tends to emphasize relative to many other interpretations of Christianity, this potential for heaven on earth. In, in Mormonism, we emphasize that the heaven that we're all hoping to live in someday is this earth transformed and glorified and that the presence of God will be there, that we'll become gods ourselves in that world. And that we, in, in other words, live in a state of um, super longevity and super intelligence. And of course, from a Christian perspective, we emphasize something like super compassion as being key among these characteristics that we would attain to. And I saw Kurzweil talking about all these sort of similar things, but from a secular angle. And that resonated with me because I liked those aspects of Mormon theology and eschatology. And then at the same time, I came across another writer um, and a philosopher out of Oxford named Nick Bostrom. Nick Bostrom, um, he had written a paper in the journal Philosophical Quarterly about what, um, what is known as the simulation argument. He's not the first person to write about the idea, but he's the most, he probably has written the most famous articulation, the most formal philosophical articulation of the simulation argument. And the gist of the argument is that we almost certainly won't go on to um, run many com um, computations of our evolutionary history unless we're almost certainly already living in one of those computations ourselves. That's the gist of the argument. And one of the ramifications of this argument is that, hey, this is interesting. So we have this expectation that great amounts, you know, large amounts of computational capacity in the future may enable us to do these incredible creative acts, such as creating new worlds indistinguishable experientially from our own, in which people like us live, in which we might be able to go and visit and participate in ourselves. And if we do that, we probably have a creator ourselves. That's the gist of the argument. And, and as you might imagine, that too resonated strongly with my Mormon upbringing, where in Mormonism, we are taught and we advocate this idea that we should become more like God in all ways, compassionate ways, but also creative ways. And that one of our potential capacities in, in the future is that we would attain unto the creative capacity of the gods and participate in those creations. And Nick Bostrom's um, ideas and arguments resonated deeply with, with me as well because of that upbringing I had received. So I eventually discovered that Ray Kurzweil and Nick Bostrom were both associated with the transhumanist community. When I discovered that, I found an organization that Nick Bostrom had founded called the World Transhumanist Association. I joined it. And at this point, I realized, and the reason I was so excited about joining it was that I had always been a transhumanist. I was raised a transhumanist. It, it, transhumanism was implicit in the Mormonism I had received. I just didn't have a word for it. And I didn't know that there were secular people who had functionally similar, even if not almost equivalent ideas. And so I joined the, the um, World Transhumanist Association. I started talking with friends, including Carl, about it. And at this point, I was undergoing a transformation. The, the readings I had been doing in the New Testament, particularly the works of Paul, the writings of William James and Frederick Nietzsche, the influence of secular transhumanists like Ray Kurzweil and Nick Bostrom, they coalesced around the aesthetic, the powerful aesthetic that I had received from the Mormon tradition and my Mormon upbringing. And my faith started to be reignited and ultimately became a, a much, I would, you know, using that metaphor of reignited, became a much stronger flame than it had ever been, even when I was a child. Um, and um, 
over a period of a few years, I was um, highly confident in identifying again as a believer, as theist, and I am to this day. Uh, so that's how I discovered transhumanism. And, and the, the core motivation behind transhumanism was that it gave me a more living option than the non-scientific or even anti-scientific interpretations of Mormonism and Christianity that I had found myself in the midst of as a child and teenager. And it had reignited for me their, their power, their transformative power in my life and the desire to share that again with other people in ways that I thought would help them like it helped me. I'm, I'm really struck by just, just bouncing off of what you've said here. I'm really struck by how transhumanism seems to function for so many people as a, a way of resolving uh, what in like the video game industry they call ludo narrative dissonance. Like there's this concept that like when you're constructing a game that it's you have a narrative to the game and then you have the gameplay itself. And there are moments when like you might be in this giant cosmic battle and there's a meteorite about to hit the earth and then you get thrown into a like match three puzzle game. And it's such a disconnect. It seems to me that there's like a similar issue for a lot of folks, especially in my age group, um, like 20s and younger or so for whom like religion feels like it's either dissociated from reality or it's kind of just like the same political discourse that we usually do just sort of dressed up in Christian vestments. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised because it seems to me that transhumanism offers a, a route to make religion a more concrete, not only experience, but like worldview and, and almost like program agenda or a way of organizing your life around it. I, I wondering if you guys could comment on kind of the, the protean nature of religion, because it seems to me that both of you have engage your religion very creatively. And I mean that in a very positive way that like you've evolved your, uh, what you were given as a religious heritage into something that to me at least seems to engage your world and your, your era in a much uh, more responsive way than just say someone wishing to stick to a strictly 19th century interpretation of Mormonism. Can you comment on, on kind of how people who may be interested in religion but maybe very like very nervous about kind of the archaic or traditionalist side of it, how they can engage religion in a meaningful and modern way. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I also just wanted to interject that uh, I apologize if my response to how I came into this was way shorter than Lincoln's. That was uh, very detailed. Thank you, you are Lincoln. all good, Carl. No worries <laughs> at all. Thank um, you. But uh, I would say, it, it would be good to preface my remarks by saying that I think Mormonism in particular maybe um, compels or at least nudges people in the direction of trying to reconcile reality with their faith more so than perhaps some other religious traditions because it emerged in a very, um, in, in a, in a post enlightenment context in which, humanity was um, learning more about its uh, world and its surroundings than they'd ever learned before. And in which there was a generally a positive attitude towards science and technology, although religion persisted and a lot of lots of folks tradition persisted, especially in the frontiers of America. Uh, still, there was a very, there was a lot of openness to science and technology and a greater understanding of their surroundings that um, started to feed back into religion. So, if, you know, if you look at the early restoration, you see that um, the the findings of the scientific world of the time were being appropriated by Joseph Smith in his theology and in his revelations. Um, there was lots of speculation about, you know, who inhabited the other planets in the solar system and, you know, the moon and other things like that. And they were you know, they were riffing off of popular ideas of the day. There were sci there were also scientific people at the time, uh, astronomers who, you know, who speculated that the other planets in the solar system might be inhabited, but this general, um, positivity towards science and technology is, I think, uh, a really core aspect of, of Mormonism. 
And um, there's also a, a kind of monistic worldview in Mormonism where there isn't a clear, distinct separation between spirit and matter. Uh, Joseph Smith described spirit as simply matter more refined. And, um, and also there's many different um, leaders in the church at various times who've spoken about all of these um, things that we may think of as miraculous as needing to be explainable and measurable and observable in some way. And so um, if, if these things are real, they, they are going to um, have some, we're, we're going to be, there's going to be some way of us understanding them eventually. Um, we may not fully understand them now, uh, but we will, we are capable of understanding them um, sooner or later. And um, this, this whole tradition in Mormonism is rather strong. And if you read the teachings of various church leaders at various times, which I kind of was an avid reader of these um, early Mormon thinkers and some also several leaders of the church. So I was already, I think, primed for this way of reconciling the things that are going on in the world with um, the maybe more superstitious aspects of my religious upbringing and feeling compelled to actually make them make sense. And to, you know, where there seemed to be an impasse or there seemed to be a contradiction to feel the need to kind of reconcile that somehow and not just leave it sitting there and treat them as non-overlapping magisteria. Um, and I think that interacting further with the world, um, both in my education, I pursued a bachelor's degree in Portuguese and eventually a master's degree in computer science. Um, I felt the need to somehow explain my faith to others in the course of pursuing my education and my career. I was often working alongside people who didn't share that perspective. Um, and I had this natural kind of, I think, um, need to, um, to, to feel like I wasn't in a complete idiot and to kind of like explain why it might make sense to still be religious in a largely secular world, um, especially coming from a background of science and technology. So maybe more than some, I felt this need to develop narratives for my belief system that were compelling and could even be explained to a secular person in a way that while they may not fully get on board, they could at least sort of understand I just felt the need to be an interpreter of, of that worldview for a larger audience. Um, and so I, um, along with Lincoln and others, uh, we've, we've worked hard on developing a vocabulary for explaining these things and analogies for explaining these things that um, maybe uh, someone who is maybe a little bit more insular in their religion wouldn't perhaps have felt. Did that answer your question? I don't even remember the original question. I'm, I'm That's sorry. All right. I don't remember half the things I say anyway. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I think that I think that really does address it. Um, I the thing that 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 I think surprises me the most about transhumanism is just the way that it very or at least religious transhumanism is the way that it very seriously engages religion. I think that almost like a uh, maybe a surface level criticism would almost be like it's just in the same thing we hear the same thing in psychology that it's just it's this sort of idea of just trying to to modernize and sort of like sanitize older traditions but what I'm interested in is just the way that transhumanism religious transhumanism seems to take very seriously the human uh, religious instinct I guess to borrow a term from Carl Jung I'm I'm surprised because it's it's um you know, there, there are folks like Freud and even like students of his, like Jacques Lacan, who are sort of pitched as these deliberately anti-religious people who see religion as like a sickness or it's a problem. But then you get quotes from Lacan who say like, you know, religion is a symptom, but don't ever think I'm going to disabuse you of this symptom or cure you of this symptom. I mean, you get you get Jung who um, was very insistent that though we live in a world that sort of feels that it's outgrown the historical instantiations of religion, kind of like, you know, mainline medieval Christianity or the like, that, that we still haven't outgrown the religious impulse 
like this this innate instinct in us. And it seems to me that religious transhumanism sort of represents that that religious instinct or that religious impulse in that it it's sort of developing and evolving what it's been handed in that form. Uh, Carl, I know that in in a number of years ago, uh, for the Mormon Transhumanist Association, you 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 brought up the 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 concept of the broken myth that the Christian theologian Paul Tillich utilizes. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about what the broken myth is? Absolutely. Um, and I would I would even venture to say, just to respond to your earlier remarks, that um, even the non-religious, I think partake more than they often realize in in a in a form of religion or in several forms of religion um for me discovering this particular concept of the broken myth that was first um developed by paul tillich was really a liberating um experience in that um it helped to me for me to characterize my explorations and my doubts uh, and concerns about religion in a way that was more positive. Um, I'd often heard it explained to me uh, by various, you know, religious um, leaders or mentors in my life that questioning and, um, and uh, doubting was dangerous and that it was something that you should avoid and be really careful about and be fearful of. And, um, what happened with Tillich is that it it helped me to realize that in in encountering questions and challenges to my traditional narratives and realizing that they may have been oversimplified to some extent or in perceiving flaws in them was a part of the, the natural maturation process, the natural process that anyone goes through as they, you know, think about the stories that they were told growing up and go, oh, maybe Santa wasn't eating those cookies that I left out the night before. Um, and they're like, oh my gosh, is Santa even real? You know, And then it's like a, a crisis of identity as you wonder how many more things your parents told you that maybe weren't exactly what you thought they were. Um, the, the same thing goes for religion. And, and of course, the flaws may be more complex than that. They may be... Um, uh, not quite as simple as that. And there may be intermediate answers along the way that are satisfying for a while, but then start to show their limitations, right? And Tillich described this process as um, a natural process that everyone goes through. And that when you are faced with a kind of question about a narrative that you've received, um, either as part of your traditions growing up or as part of your faith, um, that you kind of ha are faced with a few choices. One of the choices that you can take is to retreat into fundamentalism. That would be to kind of double down on the original narrative and say, you know, plug your ears, say, I can't hear you. Um, stop, stop making me think, you know, or various techniques that someone might use for just kind of pushing it out further. Um, and, they might even go so far as to browbeat and discourage others who are pursuing these things. And um, Tillich described this reaction as um, uh, reactive literalism, as opposed to natural literalism, which is the state that someone's in before they really know about the challenges, right? So when someone's kind of just taking everything in and for the first time, as you grow up and as you just um, pro progress in the natural order of whatever traditions you've been raised in, uh, you know, at first you may not question much and, and that would be a, a natural literalism. And he, he actually says this shouldn't be disturbed, that a person should be allowed to mature and develop in, in, in this phase. And they shouldn't be, you shouldn't try to forcibly enlighten someone, you know, who is content with uh, their faith as they've received it. Uh, but when you are faced with this juncture, you can either retreat into reactive literalism or you can do what he calls breaking the myth, which is to recognize the mythic qualities of the thing that you've received from your faith. It doesn't necessarily even mean that it's false. The term myth is often confused or misunderstood by uh, secular audiences 
because they're not used to the way that the academics are using this term. When they use the term myth, they're really talking about kind of an overarching narrative that explains your world to you, that makes sense out of your world. It's really a story that is told um, that makes sense of the world. And we still have such stories in our present world. We talk about stories about um, our national identity or our politics or stories about how the world works and how you get ahead in the world about climate change and how it's affecting our world. We have stories that we use to make sense out of the world and to determine how we should act in the world. And in many ways, these narratives and myths that we inherit in our present world are function very similarly to the narratives and myths that were in previous generations that we've inherited from our religious upbringings. Um, but as we discover flaws in these narratives, we shouldn't discard them, according to Tillich. We should recognize that they are mythic and that they have a narrative story function, um, but we shouldn't uh, throw them away. Um, we should continue, for example, to practice the rituals that we've inherited, but perhaps see in them more than just this literal um, uh, result. So, for example, if I am breaking the myth of the Eucharist as a Catholic or the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as a Mormon or a Christian, I might stop thinking, especially this applies to Catholicism, I might perhaps um, agree that I am not literally feasting upon the, the, the flesh and blood of Christ, um, but that I might still be essentially nourishing myself with the spirit of Christ in the sense of recommitting myself to partaking in the, the works of Christ and to um, lifting up the, the hands that hang down and, and the feeble knees, you know, strengthening the feeble knees, doing all the things that Christ did. And that this provides, this ritual provides me with a way of recommitting to that, uh, that vow that I've made to follow Christ. Um, you know, you could take so many different traditions that we have, and you could, you could apply this, this, um, what's the word, uh, heuristic to how, how you approach this, um, this belief, right. And, and this is what he calls breaking the myth. And for me, it really helped because I realized that many of the things I'd inherited from my faith were actually a form of idolatry where I was taking, um, something that had never been intended to be seen as God personified or embodied, you know, for example, the, the scriptures, the, the Bible, the book of Mormon are not actually holy paper. I can't become somehow sanctified by merely holding the Bible close to my head or, you know, walking around with it under my arm all the time. Um, and sometimes we have a tendency to over sanctify our religious symbols to the point where we think that they are God, right? Or they they have a sacred and holy quality in and of themselves. Uh, but what we've done there is we've uh, essentially made an idol out of something that was originally only intended to point us toward God. And um, it's a really ironic thing for religious people of all people who above all are commanded to avoid idol worship um, to actually be confronted with the fact that they might be engaging in idol worship, right? And um, for me, when I saw that some of the traditions of my upbringing had become idolatrous and that what I was doing when I was breaking the myth, according to Tillich, was actually discarding idolatry from my life, it helped me to reframe my spiritual journey in a positive way where I was seeking for something higher and something better rather than engaging in a desire to sin or to a desire, you know, it's just too hard. I'm going to just give up on this. Right. And so by being able to characterize my faith journey as a journey upward and onward, um, it helped me to not feel so afraid to not feel so guilty about questioning, about learning some of these things and to be able to characterize myself in a more courageous way, if that made sense. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I'm, I'm surprised too, because one of the things that, uh, 
I just, I, I, one of the things that I'm struck by in Mormonism is, especially in Joseph Smith, like Mormonism's founder, Joseph Smith's uh, Nauvoo era theology, the end of his life, he was, he was outlining this vision of God, not as, not as like a, a mystery that exists beyond being, but as a person who's just as embodied as you and me, who exists in time and space and who doesn't create from nothing, but creates from the matter and energy that he encounters, the things that he didn't create in an ultimate sense, that he rearranges pre-existing matters into uh, into into new shapes and patterns. It, it reminds me of kind of this Heideggerian idea of of being this this feeling of having been thrown into life. That you know you you didn't um, select every circumstance of your life. You just sort of wake up one day and realize that these these circumstances that are outside of your control largely are just already in place. And it seems to me that 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 transhumanism and and maybe in a broader sense even Mormonism is uh, an attempt to to look at those materials that those circumstances that you didn't create, that you didn't necessarily choose, and to engage them in a creative way, in a positive way. Does that sound maybe fair to say? Oh yeah, for sure. You know, as as you mentioned, Joseph Smith described Mormon theology in a very existentialist way. The God of Mormon theology is an existentialist God. I, I don't think most Mormons recognize that. But if you go and you read, for example, Joseph Smith's last, um, his last general conference sermon, people call it the, the King Follett sermon, you get this statement where Joseph Smith says that, um, the, that God found himself in the midst of spirit and matter and set about instituting laws whereby others could progress to be like him. And of course, this should be understood in context where Joseph Smith also taught that God is more than just a him. God is a community. God is people, including a heavenly mother. So he could have easily has said the gods found themselves in the midst of spirit and matter and set about instituting laws whereby others could progress to be like them. And this is, this is so cool because that's exactly how you and I find ourselves. At some point, we find ourselves in a world, in the midst of other people, in the midst of other things. And what do we do? Well, per this model, God exercises compassion in the face of this existentialist crisis from the very beginning. God finds themselves, we find ourselves, and what do we do? Well, we go about helping people so that they can do the kinds of things that we can do, have the kinds of power that we have, have the potential, the future that we have, and to share in it together. And, and so Mormon theology offers a, a solution to the existentialist crisis that, for me, has been powerful and beautiful and perpetually inspiring. Um, even when I, and I'll go back to my story, even when I was an atheist, I still found that aspect of Mormonism motivating, even when I couldn't tr trust that God already existed. Yeah, I love what Lincoln said. And I'm reminded of an essay by a uh, Mormon scholar, Adam Miller, who, um, used a similar analogy to the both this Heideggerian kind of sense of being thrown into the world as well as finding ourselves. Um, he said, uh, I, I just found it really quick. I Googled it, but it's, it's beautiful. If you don't mind, if I just read a few excerpts from it, he said, um, Dante claims that we each wake, if we wake at all, to find ourselves already midway through life. We, each of us are shaken from feverish dreams to find ourselves already promised to bodies we did not choose, to families we did not elect, to times and places we did not will. Or to borrow a similar similar image from Jonathan Swift, we each wake, if we wake at all, to find ourselves like the hero of Gulliver's Travels, smack in the middle of Lilliput, shipwrecked, bruised in the head, and already bound by 10,000 gossamer threads of circumstance. He said, he goes on to say, I born and named and promised a Mormon long before ever catching glimpse of my life found upon stirring from my dreams that I was already bound by the invisible twine of 10,000 threads to Mormonism. And he said, 
Um, it, later on, he goes on to say that um, I am convinced that not only did I wake to find myself bound to Mormonism, but that it is Mormonism that has done the waking. So his Mormon upbringing both uh, was a, a, a burden in the sense that he found himself when he finally figured out what he even wanted out of life, which I think all of us can say that it takes a while of living before you even know what you want um, to realize he was already pre-committed to a billion other things that prevented him possibly from pursuing all the things he might have wanted to pursue, um, but that also in the process of pursuing this discovery that he was um, enriched by it, right? And I think that uh, that kind of progressive journey in the midst of the universe that we inhabit is, I love the way Lincoln tied that into the same experience that God has. And I think that is a perfect answer as well to um, questions of theodicy, right? Where other people say to you, well, how can you believe in God if you see all this suffering in the world? And I really think that in the same way that God was confronted um, or at least as described, confronted in the universe with this universe amid spirits and matters and sought to institute laws whereby others might to progress. The same question is being asked of us, like, um, look, you're at the, you're in this world. It's certainly got problems. There are, you know, dangers on every side and there are people who are in desperate need of help. What are you going to do about it? Right. A great sermon was preached by uh, a Protestant minister who said every time someone shakes their fist at the heavens asking, how could you let this happen? God is looking down and asking the same exact question. Um, <clears throat> I love that. Uh, that's good. I, I, I just had a couple questions I'm going to kind of bundle together here. Um, do you, on a scale of one to 10, both of you, uh, tell me what is the likelihood that there is currently now an afterlife, that there are people in the afterlife right now? So one being highly unlikely, 10 being very likely. And then I have a follow-up question. I'll go first. I'll let, uh, Car Carl's still calculating the exact amount. Um, I, I'm going to go with um, the, I, I have a moral prerogative to express the strongest confidence in that, in a certain kind of that afterlife. And the reason I have a moral prerogative to express confidence in that is that our expectations of such things end up informing our actions toward creating such things. And if we have the capacity to create such things, um, there are some statistical likelihoods that they already exist. So, I, and, and, I, and I say certain accounts of this matter. So what do we mean by an afterlife? If by an afterlife, we mean something supernatural, I don't know anything about that. Um, our world does not lend itself to access to the supernatural. Uh, for all I know, that doesn't exist. I can't prove it doesn't, however. But if we're talking about afterlives that are extensions of the world that we presently live in, and, and all we mean by after in this case is perhaps after we died the mortal deaths that we're all looking at the face of right now, then yes, I confidently trust in an afterlife. I confidently trust that our death is not the end of our existence, that something about us persists to some extent or another, and that we will be resurrected literally, embodied glorified into more robust best bodies and have the opportunity to experience relationships, experience compassion, engage in further creative acts together as friends, as family, as a community. I trust in that with my entire heart and mind and soul. So it's a 10 out of 10? Sure. Okay, cool. Carl? And I, I would just um, riff off of what Lincoln was saying to say that um, in in a similar way, uh, let's let's just say that the probability of us ever achieving such uh, things as afterlife, as you know, li living beyond death, and eventually being resurrected in a, in and fully embodied again, uh, depends heavily on whether we believe others have already achieved such things. 
Because if we are the first or only civilization to achieve such things, then the likelihood that others, uh, th that, that likelihood seems very low. Uh, whereas if we live in a in a expansive universe where other beings far more advanced than we are have already gone beyond to achieve immortality and eternal life, um, the likelihood of our ever getting there is much greater. And so um, this is partly why I believe that Lincoln, when he did express it, said he feels a he feels compelled to trust in this partly because um, whatever we place those odds at uh, determines how we act to bring about these things in the future. If we don't feel that the notion of afterlife is at all possible ever in the future, then we're unlikely to pursue any actions now that would eventually lead to that. Um, but if we don't... so. If we don't trust in that likelihood, then we're also making, we don't, we may not realize it, but we're making a statement about what's already happened, right? So when you asked if we believe an afterlife has already happened, when I'm saying, if I say no, then I'm also saying, I don't believe that any other advanced beings more advanced than I am have ever achieved such a thing um, because the likelihood of, uh, if we, if we're never going to get there, then we will, we probably never have got, no one has probably ever gotten there before either. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I think that, um, we could get into more detail about how we even define afterlife because once again, I don't accept a kind of dualistic thinking about spirit versus matter. I think of them as a continuum more. And so I don't think it makes sense to think of an afterlife that is some sort of completely disconnected spirit from um, the mortal bodies that we inhabit. Uh, but I, I am totally willing to acknowledge the existence of many things that I don't fully understand and that there may be spiritual properties to our bodies that, that are beyond what we're presently capable of, of perceiving and observing and measuring. So I just want your thoughts on, uh, do you guys, what do you think about process theology? Do you think that process theology is something that is complementary to what you you believe? In other words, that God is kind of actively engaging and learning. Uh, he's with us in the moment. He's not in the future. He's like along with the ride. Is that kind of how you envision God is in in a in the context of process theology? Sure, I I, I have a lot of respect for process theology. In particular, I love understandings of God that connect us experientially with God, where God suffers with me when I suffer. God rejoices with me when I rejoice. And this actually uh, works very well with, a, with the stronger transhumanist anticipations of the future. Um, imagine that we use that, that computational capacity of the future to engineer, to compute, new worlds. Well, where would those worlds be experientially in relation to the person doing the computing? We often think of computers being separate from us, but over time, our computers have gotten smaller and stronger, more powerful and closer to us. They went from warehouses to our desks, from desks to our pockets. We're now embedding them into our bodies. Pacemakers keep people alive. Brain computer interfaces with brain implants help people overcome all kinds of problems, and they're getting better and better. I think the appropriate understanding of computational capacity in the future and its relationship to persons is that they will merge and become the same thing. There will, won't be any anatomical distinction between the person using the computer and the computer itself. And so these computational creations will be part of the anatomy of these creators. The worlds will be part of the anatomy of God who is in and through all things in whom we live and move and have our being as the New Testament describes it. And it's not such a leap of imagination to suppose that a creator who is anatomically connected to the creation could have an experiential connection, could suffer with and rejoice with the persons, the children that they've created. And just to place this within a, a Mormon historical context, I think um, 
you know, if, if other members of the church um, are, th- you know, occasionally we'll hear that, oh, these things aren't emphasized as much anymore or, or you know, various uh, viewpoints on this. Um, more recently, I would say that there's been some conflict between more recent leaders about the notion of God progressing in some fashion versus um, older leaders. But I love this quote from Wilford Woodruff, the fourth president of the LDS Church, who said, if there was a point where man and his progression could not proceed any further, the very idea would throw a gloom over every intelligent and reflecting mind. God himself is increasing and progressing in knowledge, power, and dominion, and will do so worlds without end. It is just so with us. We are in a probation, which is a school of experience. Um, so once again, kind of tying some interesting connections between the nature of life that God lives and the nature of life that humanity lives. But yeah, as far as pro- process theology in particular, um, I find a lot of interesting resonances there for sure. Just real quick. Um, if somebody achieves immortality um, and they decide, and there was an episode of Star Trek Voyager that contemplated this with the Q continuum, is that they're one wanted to commit suicide. Um, as Christians, would you support them committing suicide? Mormon theology already permits immortals to become mortal. Um, you know, there there's one one particular account of Mormon theology that's no longer as popular as it used to be. Of course, was um, Adam God, where um, God an immortal came to Earth and became mortal to begin the process of human civilization. And of course, there's also the idea that the pre-mortal Jesus was already God and became mortal and that um, as a mortal progressed grace by grace and returned back to a fullness of Godhood or returned or gained a fullness of Godhood for the first time. Maybe the fullness of Godhood wasn't there pre-mortally. DNC 93 talks about this um, per Mormon theology that Jesus did not have the fullness at first, just like we don't have the fullness at first. In any case, There's a long tradition in Christianity, well beyond Mormonism, that God became human so that humans could become God. It's the doctrine of theosis or deification or divinization or exaltation in in Mormon um, um, vocabulary. And and this this is not a uniquely Mormon idea. This is an ancient idea among Christians, and it predates Christians too, but Christians um, have been advocating it to various extents for 2000 years. And so unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians who think it's a heresy. But what they don't understand, like, what, here's a here's a great irony of the doctrine of theosis. Uh, by the name of divinization, for example, it's a doctrine of the Catholic Church, which is the by far the largest Christian denomination on earth. But most Catholics don't even know it's one of their doctrines. Um, divinization being that we uh, are, our purpose and potential is to participate in divinity, in godhood, with God. But most Catholics have, you know, have never even heard of the doctrine. Here's um, Church Father Athanasius uh, around 300 AD. He says, God became man that man might become God. And there's several other uh, similar quotes. Yeah, more than several. There are hundreds of Christian uh, teachers over the centuries that have explicitly taught this in the way that Athanasius did and in other ways that are even more explicit about humanity's potential for godhood. Mormons did not invent this idea, but we do emphasize it more than most Christians today. I think uh, one one concept that I find especially interesting uh, next to theosis would be uh, theurgy, the, uh, the idea that, that one sort of generates or creates a god within oneself so like there was a there was a neoplatonic writer named iamblichus who wrote a lot about this that in his view that gods like existed as these lights in the sky and you would go through these like ritual very concrete processes of essentially in your mind uh leaving like leaving the confines of the physical world and in your mind going to to merge with these gods in such a way that their identity their divine identity comes back with you after these ritual uh enactments like there's this idea that you embrace the god to such a degree that you become like that god that you sort of become what you worship 
there's a there's a quote from the uh, philosopher, I, I believe it was John Caputo in his book on religion. He paraphrases St. Augustine as saying, basically, what do I love when I love my God? It seems to me that that Mormonism and, and transhumanism in a very, even if in a deliberately secular way as well, has kind of this theurgic bent to it, which is that religion is almost like a just another mode of discourse in trying to describe this experience of articulating what kind of human being we believe we should be in this world, and then trying to merge with that ideal in our actions and creating symbolic frameworks and ritual frameworks and complexes to sort of facilitate that. I, I guess I, I say all that though, to ask this question that for for the for the two of you, what kind of God are you working to become? What do you want to like, what do you want to embody into the world? The, the virtues of compassion, creativity, and courage at their limits. That's the kind of God I worship pragmatically as a consequence of that worship, as you've pointed out. That's the kind of um, provocative influence I have intentionally in my life is to become more like such a being, more like such a community. Um, super intelligence applied to compassion creativity and courage. And I think my answer would be somewhat similar. It reminds me of something I'm actually working on right now. Um, it's all right. I'm going to share a little link in the chat here uh, that you're welcome to share with your viewers. It's, this is actually still in a beta phase, but we're in the process of rebuilding the MTA website, the Mormon Transhumanist Association's website. And one thing, one particular aspect of godliness that I feel is very compelling and almost transcends any kind of ideological um, extremes or polarization in our culture is, is that of creati creativity. So um, as we think of flourishing in creativity, um, in doing our best to build better worlds to imagine and conceive of better things and then try to go build them. I think that's a pursuit that almost everyone can get behind. You know, it's something that inspires nearly all of us. And in this um, new version of the website, I've sought, we've, we've sought to highlight that by asking the visitor, you know, what will you create? Um, what community will you create? What kind of life will you create? What heaven ultimately will you create? And to inspire them to um, seek better things than than they currently have. So uh, that's one of the things that really inspires me. And I think that as we try to conceive of whatever might be this better world, it inevitably is going to include the kind of compassionate um interaction that we experience and that we read of in the scriptures from Jesus Christ, right? The kinds of ways that he reached out to his, uh, his fellow humans, um, those who are downtrodden, those in various circumstances, that's the kind of, um, the kind of virtue and the kind of, um, world that I want to live in and that I want to help to, to build. That's beautiful. Thank you. I um I I have two final questions, and that would be how I end end things out. But Steve, I definitely don't want to shortchange you if you've got any more questions. Oh no, go ahead. Uh, actually, okay. ask your questions. This is uh, this has been a really good conversation, guys. Really enjoying. Yeah, it. I've I've really loved this. Thank you guys so much. I so my my two final questions. One is a little cheeky because I stole it from someone else, but I think Tim Ferriss stole it from someone else in turn, so it's fine. Um. His, his question essentially is, if you could have a billboard in a well-populated interstate anywhere in the United States, and you could use that billboard to essentially share with someone just like one quick phrase, something that you think would be most important for someone to take in and, and keep it at the top of their mind and their lives today, what would, what would that phrase be for you? Go ahead, Lincoln. Well, because, because people come at billboards 
with such diversity of background and purpose and lack thereof sometimes. I, I guess I would have to go with the Beatles and just say, hey, let's start with love. And then we can start discussing everything else after that. So something about love is is the right starting point. And as you know, as as the the apostle Paul points out in the New Testament, um, knowledge will fail, prophecies will fail, everything will fail. There's only one thing that won't, and that is love. And I and I do truly believe that. I think it has to be a foundation for anything worth doing or building. So just because this has been on my mind lately, I'm going to go with the thing I just shared, which is, you know, what heaven will you create? That's the kind of thing I would stick on a billboard any day. In fact, we're probably working on doing something like that on a billboard on, on I-15 sometime soon. Um, you know, the, I think one of the reasons I, I think this is a great provocative phrase um, that someone unfamiliar uh, with our work could immediately be inspired by is that in four or five um, short words, it um, evokes both what our whatever our ideal is, which is heaven, right? But then invites the visitor, the viewer to get off their couch and join in, right? And helps them to realize that uh, it may not happen without their efforts, right? So um, I can't think of a better short way of um, encapsulating uh, so much of the work that we're about. You know, go back to that description, that existentialist description of God from Joseph Smith, where the gods find themselves and what do they do? Well, they start creating compassionately. They're not creating just for themselves. They're creating for others. And they're creating. I mean, that really is the core of what Mormon transhumanists advocate. And frankly, as Carl has pointed out, very common among many other groups of people too, even if they don't perhaps articulate it the same way we do. I have an answer to that question too, if you want me to answer it then. I would love it, please, Steve. I was thinking about it and these guys were talking and I thought, I think the very last question I asked you on our interview, it was a question. So I want people to contemplate. And the final question I asked you was, and I would put on the billboard, who is Jesus to you? I love that. I think that's fantastic. I think uh, just even speaking as kind of the the psych student and not at all to reduce religion to just purely psychology and, and cognitive science and the like, but I one of the things I love about everything that everyone here has said is just that that Jesus to me seems to be like this beautiful focal point where you do so much of your thinking about who you should become in this world. Like Jesus seems to embody so many of the ideals and the values that, that each of you hold and, and sort of becomes a, a ground for you to think and to consider and evolve those values. So I just, I, I want to thank each of you for, for sharing those values, those ideas, the ways that you find meaning in the world, uh, especially just for this, I think really strong first episode of uh of this youtube channel so thank you thank you very much all of you yeah thanks so much for letting us be a part of it um just real quick uh before we close i just wanted to say something interesting about this whole appeal to a being in this case um all of us as christians jesus christ um uh, as a focal point is that um we often may uh fashion this focal point even beyond anything that they themselves may have said or done. Right. Um, and you know, as you know, it can, uh, the, the myth can gain a life of its own. Um, and I think that what, where we could unite with, even with secular audiences in this, in this regard is that all of us are capable of conceiving of whatever we think that the highest ideals, the highest virtues to be, and in many ways, Christianity chooses to embody those in an individual, right? And um, but but we can unite with all of our uh, brothers and sisters from various religions in the sense that we can uh, we all have some ideal that we can conceive of, and we can all work towards embodying that ideal more fully than we do now. And importantly, Christianity embodies those virtues in an individual who 
goes out of his way over and over again to invite us to become one with him in, in embodying those ideals. That's perfect. I love that. Well, with that, then I have just one final question for each of you. Where can we uh, find you online if we want to see more of you? Yeah, so um, definitely visit transfig transfigurism.org. That is where you will find the website of the Mormon Transhumanist Association. And um, you'll be able to reach out and contact me and others in the association through that uh, portal. And uh, I'm also on um, Twitter and various other things and would be happy to share those links with you so that you can share them with your audience. Yeah, absolutely. I will. Any any social media handles y'all have, I can put in the, the description to this video. In fact, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I, I also uh, have blogged for a long time at lincoln.metacanon.net. You can just Google my name, Lincoln Cannon, come right at the top of the search results. I, I write about technological evolution, post-secular religion, and of course, Mormon and Christian transhumanism and have been doing that for, I don't know, more than 15 years. So there's a lot of articles on those topics there for you to look at. Perfect. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, my uh, one of my other honorary guests, Stephen Pinecker. This is uh, again a joint production between Steve and I for uh, with between Mind Makes This World and Mormon Book Reviews. And I'll I'll have a, for sure a, a link in the description to the first part of this conversation. So anyone who wants to to hear everything that Lincoln and, and, and Carl had to say to at the beginning as, as well, can can go check that out. Um, Steve, where can we find you though? Well, mormonbookreviews.com uh, is my website. Uh, you just uh, search Mormon Book Reviews on YouTube. We're also available in all the major podcast formats, Apple, Spotify, Google. So uh, you can also listen to our audio as well. And the average is about 1500 views and downloads a day now. So I tell people it's a mega church a day that's listening and it's kind of cool. But I want to thank you, Nathan, and I want to wish you well on this endeavor, because I'll tell you, it took me three months to get 100 subscribers. It isn't easy. And I, I just want to wish you Godspeed, because I, I think I kind of helped you push you in this direction. And I'm going to do everything I can to help you in this endeavor. And I want to wish you well, man, because I think you're a really awesome dude. Thank you so much, Steve. You've, you've done so much for me. And uh, I definitely would not be here talking to some of my favorite people in the the world of Mormonism, in fact, were it not for just all the opportunities you've offered and the encouragement, the support. So thank you so much. Okay. Well, with that, then um, I guess uh, I guess that's the conclusion here. So uh, viewers, thank you so much for watching and listening. However, you're consuming this content. If you liked it, be sure to click that like button. And if you want to see more, click subscribe and ring that little bell to be notified of any time that we. Uh, upload any new content to this channel. And of course, if you have any questions for me or for Lincoln or for Carl or even for Steve as well, please feel free to leave those comments uh, down below. And with that, I will uh, see you all in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.